this is Drumwise Meets, and today I'm here with Jeff Rich, who's played for Status Quo, and he's currently in Triple J. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Al. So, my first question is the, the typical first interview question. What age yeah. did you get into drums? Uh, what bands inspired you, and what was your first drum kit? Well, I first got into drums, I was about nine years old. Um, I started playing uh, on the normal pots and pans, my mum's knitting needles and all that. And I saw a black and white film with Gene Krupa on drums, American film, musical. And I saw this guy playing, he was, he was like the modern day equivalent of Animal. It was the first drummer that actually attacked a drum kit, and I couldn't believe this guy. He was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And that guy really inspired me, really, to start playing after watching him. And from there, I, I got, I've saved up to get first, my first little snare drum. My parents couldn't afford to do it. I did it myself by Saturday jobs and bits and pieces, and then build up a little drum kit. And um, eventually, started playing in bands in school and the bands that influenced me first were my first big influence was Jimi Hendrix, uh, The Who, Small Faces, um, Santana, big influence as well. Um, and then I got into sort of solely stuff as well, sort of James Brown, that sort of stuff, and um, Isley Brothers. Uh, and I just, my, Taste started to go wider and wider, and I started getting to reggae, Bob Marley, that sort of stuff, uh, which I think is a good thing because now I can play sort of all different styles, which is great for me, really. So I love, I love all types of music. Mm. Good stuff. And can you remember what your first drum kit was? So it was a John Gray Autocrat kit, which is. Uh, <laughs> I God knows where it came from. I think it was made somewhere uh, in Madagascar or something like that. And it had, looked like we constituted matchboxes. But to me, it was everything. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, I had sort of, you know, uh, uh, calf skins on, which were a paint of tune. But uh, yeah, I saved up all my money, did uh, cleaning windows and stuff. I was sitting on pots of fishing. So of course, I had to pay for everything myself really, but then you appreciate things when you've got them, if you, if you do it yourself, so mm. there you go. Absolutely. And talking about uh, drum kits, what equipment um, are you currently using? Obviously I see you've got a beautiful vintage Ludwig in front of you there, but what's your kind of- It is, like? yeah. Well, the kit here is uh, a 66 Ludwig Super Classic. Um, I've had it for about a couple of years now. I got it from this guy in, in Holland who, who was advertising it. And it had come from the States. And when I got it, it still had the original heads on. Wow. So that means, you know, it means that it's hardly been played. I mean, it's in fantastic condition. It looks like new. The chrome is, is unbelievable. Mm. And the sound is fantastic. They use it just for recording. I don't do any gigs with it mm. because, and that's why it's set up here because we have been remotely recording with my band mm. at the moment. We're doing about seven tracks. We put them on social media soon. So I've, I've finished that now, but I've left it up for this. But um, it's good to practice in here as well. So, and I've got a, a Ludwig Black Beauty snare, which is a 79. Uh, and it was one of the last ones that was made. They, they engraved it, this snare drum. And uh, they did about 200 of these engraved ones. So it's like rocking horse shit. <laughs> it's, that, it's that rare. So, um, great snare drum. I use it a lot on it, a lot, lots of stuff. And uh, I got it from Rick Allen from Death Leopard. So I was helping him at the time get a new kit together. And it, it, he couldn't use a, a regular acoustic drum. He had all electronic stuff. So I got it from him. And I've used it ever since. So Loads of stuff, all out and stuff down, and yeah, great, yeah. great, great, great drum. Cool. Best snare drum I've ever had. 
What about symbols and uh, sticks? Symbols, uh, well, symbols, um, I use post now. I've used them now for forever. I can't remember the last time I didn't use parsley. I get the odd to now and again, but um, I love Pisces symbols. I love the people who run the company. They're fantastic people. They're so into what they do. Uh, and I've been around the factory quite a few times in the past. It's fantastic. It's right in the mountains in Switzerland. Uh, this, this is just a basic setup. I've got tw uh, 14, 16 crash, 17 crash, which is quite unusual. Um, one of those Swiss cheese symbols. Mm. Uh, nice ride. So 13 hi hats. I don't like big hi hats. Mm. So I always use quite small ones. Better get much better sound when you record them as well. If you not spill on them. Mm. So that's, and then I've got another set. Uh, I've got a DW kit, big one that I use when I'm doing big shows. That's Blue Sparkle actually. That's right. mm. <laughs> my first kit. Uh, but that's got a lot more symbols. Same, all Pisces, and then I've got also a, a very small DW um, frequent flyer kit, which is tiny, which is for small pubs and clubs and stuff. Hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. So let's just talk a bit about um, influences here. So I think that as drummers, we evolve as we as we uh, get older, and obviously as we um, learn more. Um, but yeah. Um, so we obviously have lots of different influences, but if you had to pick just one, who would be your all time favorite drummer? Oh, that is so difficult because I've, I've seen so many fantastic drummers. That is such a hard question. I, I, someone that's alive or, or just anyone? Anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Wow. Oh, or you yeah. could do one that's alive and one that's not. That might yeah. be easier. Okay. <laughs> one that's not not alive would most probably be well, it's a cross between Jim Cook and Buddy Rich, really, because they were both fantastic players, but different, totally different types of players, but it, equally as good. Buddy Rich was the, the best um, technician of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. But Cooper played from there. Mm. He had this something special about the way he played. So I don't think Gene Cooper, I would think. Um, more modern, difficult, I would most probably say John Bonham. Mm. Because I, I saw him, I was so lucky. I, I saw him at the Marquee Club in London. So uh, I used to go down there a lot when I was about 16, 17. And I used to see bands that were up and coming bands and no one knew about them. Because there was Zeppelin there and the Hood, all these different sort of bands that were just new bands at the time. My next question is, what's been the highlight of your career so far? Whoa. There's been so many. Um, I suppose, when we, we played Nebworth twice, um, once with Queen, and then we did it with, um, uh, it was like a huge festival from Nord of Robins, quarter of a million people each time. <laughs> so that's a massive, massive crowd. Yeah. Uh, I also played at Central Park in New York. Uh, there was Elton John on the bill. And play, that's 400,000 on that, that game. So big, big shows. But yeah, I, I love playing gigs. So whether it's 400,000 or 40 people, mm. it doesn't make a difference to me. I just love playing. So even at my age, I still love playing, which is great. Because when I, the time I sit behind this, I think, oh, I can't be dealing with this. That's when you stop, isn't it? But that'll never happen. Yeah. Because, you know, it's just I love playing so much. Um, so yeah, they're, they're memorable gigs. With my band, I just, it's great for me to play something in a band that I've got control over and I can control what we play to a certain extent. Um, and I'm playing music I want to play, which is great. 
it's just mm -hmm. like a great situation for me to be in. Mm. Yeah, so, cool. Well, there's some pretty good career highlights right there, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah. talking about Quo uh, for a bit here, we've got quite yeah. a few uh, students, so adult students, who are big Quo fans. And I've got a couple of questions that I think they would like me to ask you. So, yeah, as long as it's not personal high quiet, Gene, it'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, what, 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 what is um, about a specific song. So, a song I imagine you will have played live. So, one of our students, Paul, uh, is a big Quo fan and he really likes mystery song. It's a song that he wants to be able to play one day. And, yeah. I've heard a couple of versions of it. The studio version, like the main groove of it, is quite fast, eighth note high. It's fast. Yeah, yeah. Then I've heard a live version. I, I can't remember what year it was, so I don't know who it was playing it. It may have been you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it was played in quarter notes on the hi hat. Quarter so, notes. That's right. My, my question is really, how did you play it? Um, I think I played it in quarter notes. Yeah. Yeah, I played it in quarter notes because yeah. the bass. Uh, it's playing like you know, just playing like. Let me try. Really fast to try and do that. Yeah, uh, lay into that. Because <laughs> you, you can actually you can actually put little bits on the way out. Mm. Cool notes in between, or eight, eight notes in between, but it's not, it, it's much better because you, you wouldn't have to hi hat close like that anyway. Mm. You play this song, you sort of, so it's sort of so it gives that splashy sound anyway. Mm. So when you mix it in with everything else, it's, it's, it's the feel, isn't it? It's the groove, it's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, that clears that up. Cool. Uh, yeah. uh, another question is about um, rocking all over the world. At the end of rocking all over the world, where you get that. Dum, dum, cum, dum, 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 dum. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you play that on the bass drum, or did you just swerve that bit and just keep the groove going? You play it on the bass drum. Yeah. So. Yeah, cool. Because again, I've heard different people play that differently all the time. Uh, so, yeah, but it's, it's, it's at the very end when it's going round and round, it sort of builds, and you can stop going. Bang, 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 start doing all different symbol crashes on it as well. Yeah. And actually, talking about this, how did you learn those songs? Because obviously, you know, you had to learn them um, after yeah, but it had already been done. So you, you do. Well, you learn them. I, mean, I, I, I was brought up on stuff like Quo anyway, so I knew the bands when I first joined. I knew this, a lot of the songs anyway, so that helps. And then when you play live, a lot of bands have their own interpretation of the song for live, which is different to the studio stuff. So we would rehearse the stuff anyway, and you always want to put your own stamp on, on the. Well, when we joined, me and Rhino, the bass player, John, when we joined, because we joined as a rhythm section, and we come from other bands together, playing together. We played for years together. People like Julie Zook were in. The Climax Blues Band were together. Lots of bands. So we had a real affinity of playing together as a rhythm section. So when, when we were approached to play with Quo, and we had the first rehearsal, Francis was very reticent. He hated change, Francis Rossi. He, hates, he just wants everything to be as is all the time. So when two new guys come in, it's like, whoa, I'm not sure about this. But as soon as we start playing the songs and put a slightly different slant on what the other guys were doing, it was more power to it, it was more energy. He was going, whoa, this is good. I like this, you know, because it was different. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And Another thing I've been asked to ask you about, your um, rock till you drop tour in a day. Um, can you just talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, 
Can I swear? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hard. <laughs> Simple as that. It was, it was Jim, you know, the manager who, unfortunately, is no longer with us now, at the time, he'd come up with this idea, because the album's called Rock to Your Drop. I know, let's play four, four gigs in a day. And then the logistics of doing that. So when we rehearsed for this Rock to Your Drop, we rehearsed at Bray Film Studios. And it was a massive sound stage, and there was four different stages set up. And on each stage, we had identical gear. So it's like four different drop ball drum kits, four lots of gear, everything was set up exactly the same. So we rehearse the set on one lot of gear, then go to the next lot of stuff, rehearse it on that, then the next lot of stuff. So everything was uniform. Then that got sent to different parts of the UK. Then we had a helicopter take us from one gig to the other. Because we started off, I think, the first gig was in uh, Birmingham. Then we went to, was it Birmingham? I think so, or Sheffield. What in Sheffield? Then, then Scotland, then Birmingham, then London. I think that's how it went. I can't remember. It was such a long time ago. And by the, by the last gig, I mean, we were doing like almost an hour each gig. And with all the travelling, you can imagine, it was yeah. mental. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end, I was like, oh, just, yeah. Yeah, hit that last one and then just fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it was just hard, really difficult. Yeah. But look, we, we raised about a quarter of a million that day for children's charity, so it was worth it, worth doing it. It was fantastic. That's great, yeah. That's cool. Um, and can you talk to us a bit about your work with Def Leppard and, uh, and Rick Allen? Um, and right. maybe, maybe talk to us about um, what happened to Rick, just for people that maybe don't know, which they should, but, you know, just in case. Uh, just kind of well, Rick, fill us in with that. Yeah, Rick, Def Leppard were from Sheffield, Sheffield based band, and they started quite, very young actually, young band. I think Rick started with them, I think he was about 16, something like that, 17, very young. And I met Rick, I was playing for a girl called Judy Zook, girl singer, and we were touring, and the guy who did our monitors was Rick's brother. So Def Leppard were just beginning to break in America, but they had a, a, a little time off in between. And he said to his brother, do you mind if I come out and tour with you? I'm a bit of a loose hand, I'm not doing anything. But yeah, so he came out and, and stood by the side and helped his brother. And when we were at the sound check, Rick would come up to me and say, Jeff, how do you play this? Because he was only young, he was only about 16, 17. Mm. How do you do this? How do you play? So I showed him all different bits and bits and pieces. And he was a good drummer. It's really good. Anyway, we lost contact for a little while. And then I heard that he had this awful car accident where he lost his arm. I got in touch with the hospital and um, left my date number and everything. Eventually, his management got in touch with me and said, look, we want to keep Rick on as a drummer because we can, we've worked out, we could use, get into use an electronic kit and use his feet where his left arm would have been to play. It's a totally different way of playing, but we, he wants to pl work with a drummer who he respects as a drummer. And he wants you to help him, help him do it. Which I felt quite humbled at the time to be, to have been asked. Mm. So, because they were doing tax years, I had to go, they were recording Hysteria at the time. So they were over in Holland. So I had to go to the studio in Holland and they had this kit set up. We worked out how he was going to use his feet. And then from there, we went to Paris and lived in Paris for a little while. And then Dublin. So because they wouldn't come in and doing tax years all the time. Mm. And eventually, um, we went out and did some shows. Uh, and we did some warm-up shows in Ireland. And we got to one gig. Uh, it was in the middle of nowhere. I can't tell you what gig. And the stage was really small. And I said to Rick, we're not going to get two drum kits on it. Because he was playing, so we were playing side by side on stage. And I said, we're not going to get two drum kits on. I said, why don't I go to the back? You do the gig and I'll tell you if you can cut it or not. Because at that time I was getting hassled by Quo to join them. I'd already done some stuff for Quo in between. So it was a bit 
scared and I said, it'll be fine. And he did the whole gig and I went back and I said, you're on your own, mate. That's it. Mm. You can do it. Mm. It just needed that bit of extra mm. confidence, really. Yeah. So, yeah. So you guys so played, it. initially you played together. He was on the more electric. On stage. Yeah. Yeah, I, ha I had a big tarmac kit then with, mm. the, you know, the square cage. Oh, yeah. The big cage, the square one. Because when I was quite, I had a cage, I had one made for me, it went sort of in semicircle. This was bog standard sort of <laughs> scaffolding. <laughs> and uh, I had that, and then he had a, a, his electronic kit next to me. Yeah. So, yeah, it was good. It was, it was a great experience. A lovely, lovely guy. It's, it's so down to earth, untouched by any fame or fortune or anything. You know, they still go and have their football once, well, I think one of them Sheffield United you know, once, Sheffield Wednesday. Um, they just, they love, they're just down to earth blokes, mm. simple as that. Mm. Oh, that's, that's a nice story, cool. Yeah. Uh, moving back to um, just general drum questions here. So, have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you won't believe it, bro. I don't know if this, some people might know about this. Um, we played uh, Nebworth. You remember what about playing Nebworth? The night before, we played a gig in Denmark. And after the gig, they took us out for a meal. And I had some dodgy seafood that night. So oh, about middle of the night, I'm up, technically all shit in the lot, They're everything, right? So we get to Networth, and I was in a right mess. You can imagine, because I'm up all night, I've lost all the body fluid, got no strength at all, called the doctor, he said, look, you're gonna have to, he gave me a shot, and he said, you're gonna have to drink all this liquid and stuff. Right. I managed to get on stage. While I'm on stage, I could feel myself going. So that's to get oxygen. I had an oxygen cylinder, playing with the oxygen cylinder on. It's carried on. Just about made the gig, just about did it. This is in front of a quarter of a million people. And we've gone off, and Harvey Goldsmith has come on and said, Unfortunately, Status Phone can't come on and do an encore because the drummer's got the shits. <sighs> to all these people, he said, He announced it to all the people. <laughs> so we'd already gone because we had a gig that night in Switzerland. We got a plane to Switzerland, but the time I got to Switzerland, I felt great again. It was bizarre. bizarre. I got on stage, played a full kit, full, full gig, and that was it. So we did three gigs in two in, in two days. So, yeah. and what, the moral of that story is, guys, don't have dodgy seafood the night before a gig. Exactly. <laughs> I think it was mussels I had, and I love mussels. I still eat them now, but it's just one of those things. It, was, it just could have been one dodgy mussel. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, so, what are your hobbies away from drums? I've got a lot of hobbies. Before I spoke to you on this, on this interview, I was doing a workout with my PT. I've got a PT guy that I do two or three times a week with, but we're doing it through social media at the moment. So because he can't come over, or I go to him. So uh, I do that two or three times a week, because you've got to keep fit still. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a big garden. I've got about an acre of land. I've got geese down there and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of looking after. I love doing it all, I love doing it. I've got a ride on mower, so I'm on the oh, tractor mower. <laughs> yeah, so I've got, I do that. Um, um, I love watching football. Unfortunately, I can't at the moment. <laughs> But apparently they just announced he's coming back again, which is great. So I love my sport. I love watching sport. Um, and I like going out as well, going to gigs and stuff like that. So I've got quite a few different things. And I love reading. love reading books. Mm. I'm an average reader. Mm. Good stuff. So there you go. Yeah. 
and I think probably the cars are still a hobby for you as well because <laughs> this is this isn't a hobby. This is this is uh, what can I say? A life, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is to me. This to me means everything. Yeah. You know, you could do it. I could be on the streets. I've got no money as long as I play my kit. I'll be happy. Mm. Yeah. I say it. And that's. I say it like uh, about it being a hobby because I, I think that for all of us, drums start as a hobby. You know, when you got your first blue spark yeah. kit, you know. I, I still, I still, when I'm out playing, I don't look at it as work. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's great. When you're playing in a band, you're playing with a bass player, a guitar player, whatever, and it's all happening. It, you, it's not, it's not work. <laughs> I mean, I could, think, I could think of a lot worse things than this to do some work than that. This is fantastic. This is the best thing ever, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. We're, we're, we're blessed to have this talent that we can play and enjoy it and get paid for it as well. Mm. Well, occasionally, anyway. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, unless, you, unless you get an unscrupulous promoter that takes all your money, which we've had in the past. <laughs> so... Going from hobbies to something else, um, this is probably the most important question of this interview. So uh, I hope you're ready for this one, Jeff. I'm ready. So, actually, I've asked a few people for this and I've not been able to because I've not had a kit. Can I have a drum roll, please? Of course. That was just a double stroke? Yeah, uh, just a normal double stroke roll. <laughs> Yay. The question is... <laughs> The question is, what's your favourite biscuit? My favourite biscuit? Yeah. Whoa. Um, actually, I like their peanut. They've got peanuts in them. They're like a cookie with peanuts on. I can't remember what they call that. I think they're like a hobnob with peanuts in. Oh, Does that okay. make sense? Okay. Yeah, it's an unusual biscuit. I love peanuts, so I they're in the biscuits. So, that's yeah, they're my favourites. Okay, so well, that's, that's yeah. a different one. What? Yeah. <laughs> it's, is it, is that an unusual, it's an unusual biscuit, isn't it? I've, yeah. I've, not, I've, I've done a lot of these interviews now, and that's not been an answer that we've had so far. Um, yeah. But it seems the, the, the drummer's choice of biscuit really is either a rich tea, a bourbon... Well, I was going to say, I was going to say rich tea, but Dunkin'... Rich yeah. tea, without a doubt. Right. Rich tea, great. Unless don't eat in too long. Yeah. Otherwise, of course, you get ah. Yeah. It's still in the in the tea. Just a little bit dunk, perfect. But you can't dunk the ones I'm talking about. They're crunchy ones right. with peanuts in. But of course, when you drink the tea, they're lovely. But oh. dunking, pure dunking, rich tea is definitely yeah. And what about um? Tea bag, how would you, how long would you leave your tea bag? With? Oh, we in my house. We have teapots. Right. This is in that. It's a ritual in this house, right? It's from my missus is from Ireland. When they make tea, they I before I mess up the tea bag in the cup. Oh no, we have a teapot with the tea cozy on. Yeah. Okay. And if you forget to put the tea cozy on. She's like, because she calls it that. Where's the hat? What are you doing with the hat? So I put the tea cozy on, right? On the milk, separate milk jug. Or oh, it's a, like it's a it's a it's a big deal. Mm. Yeah. So we and of course we let tea brew in a teapot, but it's the best cup of tea ever. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. do you do you go back for a second cup? Like if there's still enough in there? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. And um, third cup. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If there's, yeah, because we have quite a good tea pot. So. Do you believe yeah. in uh, a tea bag for the pot as well? We put in uh, two, 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 two tea bags because they're quite big ones we use. Sometimes three if you want a really strong cup. But two is enough because you, you stir it. Yeah. Just grab some of that fucking tea and I'm not going to drum in with you. <laughs> <laughs> love it, I love it. Yeah, so two tea bags, stir it, occasionally three if you want a really strong, and then hat on, leave it through, couple of minutes, mwah, done. I think that's where I'm going wrong. I don't have a hat for my uh, teapot, so. Oh, go on the internet, 
Like, look for tea cozy, right? In fact, I bought one the other day. There's for Amazon, yeah? Look at Amazon. Tea cozy is tea cozy's for days, mate. You'll get loads of them. Get, pick up the colour you want, stick it on, and put the one that goes right over the tea pot, not just that, not just leaves a handle right on. If you put it over the whole thing, it's like a central heating thing. You might need something to put around the handle, though, because otherwise you burn your hands. Uh, look, look at that, see? Good tips right here. That's what Drumwise Meats is all about. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you bit of drumming now and again? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question is, what, what, are your, what are your geese called? What are their names? <laughs> well, believe it or not, we don't name our geese because we've had a few now. The one before the girl, the, the goose that we've got now, the one before her, <clears throat> she got taken by the fox. Oh. Unfortunately, well, the fox, foxes are buggers. They don't actually. They take the heads, the neck off, and just leave the carcass sitting there. Oh, bastards! Oh. So we've got. We don't name them because anything can happen. We keep them inside, and in in we've got like a sort of a stable type thing. They go in there in the evening, and we let them around all day. Mm. She's sitting on her eggs at the moment, so ah. she, they stay. They sit on the eggs for about four to six weeks, hmm. they don't come off. They sit on these bloody eggs. And there's no guarantee they're gonna hatch anyway. Hmm. So we're still waiting to see if we've got any goslings. Uh -huh. That's what they're called, by the way. Yeah. Baby goslings. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, so I've got two dogs as well. Oh, what are their names? <laughs> oh yeah, Lily and Charlie. And a cat, um, Nala. Nala? Nala. No yeah. way. Um, yeah. My cat was called Nala when I was younger. Really? From the it's from, it's from, from the Lion King. Yeah, that's Nala, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I've got Nala. The cat's a nutter, though. Absolutely <laughs> nutcase cat. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so yeah, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a sort of menagerie we've got here. Uh, there we go. That's great. Yeah. And, and four kids as well. <laughs> they're, they're the hardest to control. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway. So back to drums. Um, yeah. My my last question, um, serious question. If you could give one bit of advice to up and coming drummers, what would it be? Practice. 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 Simple as that. There's no easy route. If you want to become successful at any instrument, you have to work fucking hard. I mean that. The other thing is, <clears throat> listen to all types of music. Don't just listen to, if you like rock music, you think, ah, oh, right, I'm going to be a rock drummer. So all I'm going to listen to is rock music. Don't do that. Listen to everything. Because you might say, oh, that bit of reggae is fantastic. Soul. Some great funk drummers. Look at the Bernard Purdy, one of the best drummers around. Great drumming. Mm. You know, there's so many different types of genres of music. You got to listen to, them. and what you do, you take bits from everything to create your own style and play. That's what it's all about. That's why successful drummers come come from, because they're not just listening to one type of music. They listen to everything. Mm. That's really important. Jeff, thank you so much for spending your time with us here at Drumwise today. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Anytime.